process of the growth of labor productivity. We have 40 participants. Maybe someone will join later. The theme of uh, uh, labor productivity uh, became one of the key themes of this April conference this year. We had a round table discussion about the sources of long-term growth. Uh, this is uh, related to labor productivity. Then uh, a presentation about studies of the factors of uh, labor productivity took place. The uh, report was prepared by a group of uh, high school of economics scholars uh, under supervision of uh, Mr. Simachov. And now another presentation will take place uh, of the report prepared uh, under the supervision of uh, Mr. Vaskabuynikov. It's an interesting theme, and all uh, the uh, reports have no not only analytical component, but also recommendations, which I hope will be heard. I'm giving the floor to Jakob Vaskabonikov, then Alexander Shirov after the presentation will give his feedback and then we'll have questions and answers. Uh, Ilya Borisovich, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Yevsei Tomovich. Yevsei Tomovich, thank you very much. I will try to uh, be according to the schedule, 40 minutes, and uh, I hope we'll have the capacity to discuss the issues. I will speak about the sources of uh, labor productivity after the shocks of 1998 and 2008 in the context of the prospects of economic growth recovery. Long-term growth sources do not emerge fast and do not disappear fast. And an important point for us, uh, what will be the source of growth of Russian economy when it uh, will be recovering from the crisis of 2020 is important for us. It's a concern of all of us because currently in the stage of the crisis, it's important for us to capitalize on the opportunities which are available in order to have bigger growth in the future. And we should not waste resources on false hypotheses, on some illusions uh, where can growth come from. Uh, and the past experience can be beneficial for us during planning of the measures of stimulating growth to use the sources which will probably work. It uh, will not rule out looking for other sources, of course. It uh, does not rule out uh, calculations, uh, scenario calculations, but we can use the past experience for the benefits of the future. We are having a serious crisis right now. If you look at the focus uh, regarding the uh, decline of GDP for 2020, you can see that the decline can be much greater than the previous crisis. Uh, the range of the values of a decline is uh, big uh, from the uh, small uh, numbers of the development center uh, uh, to the uh, bold forecasts of Alexei Kudrin from accounting chamber. There are other forecasts. Of what is important for us, this crisis will be much more severe in terms of scale of recession uh, than before. Speaking of long-term growth sources, it is common uh, to divide them uh, into two groups. Extensive sources related to 
factor expenditures and intensive sources related to implementation of new technologies and the reduction of uh, costs per unit of production. These components extensive and intensive start interacting and they can give us an answer to the question, what's the nature of the growth and what are the prospects of accelerating growth? Analysis of extensive and intensive components will be the uh, uh, one of the main, the main points of my presentation. What was the growth in the Russian economy in the 20 recent years? If we look at the signs of formation of growth sources, uh, the first thing we have to think of is the fact that uh, the growth of capital intensity correlates with the uh, oil price growth level. The extensive component which uh, relates to factor uh, costs is probably related to uh, gain of resources through this channel. On the other hand, when we speak about the intensive component, we speak about economic technologies, we speak about transformation of the factors into the final product and to what extent this transformation uh, is in line with the best available um, production uh, methods. Labor productivity uh, compared to other countries is a rough measure uh, showing if, if convergence has play, uh, takes place. If we compare uh, labor productivity in the Russian economy for the 20 recent years, we can see convergence uh, uh, occurred in the Russian economy, especially from 2002 to 2011, and then probably this technological convergence slowed down. These are uh, rough estimates. Of course, some external manifestations. If we understand to what uh, the main uh, source of economic growth is labor productivity for uh, the Russian economy, like for most other um, post-industrial economies with low uh, pace of uh, population growth. Russia had to crisis of 1998 and 2008, some shocks, and after these shocks, Russia move to some long-term growth trajectory. It's interesting to see what long-term sources of growth which worked before can work after the crisis of 2020. I'll stress one again. It's not a scenario calculation what I'm going to tell you about. They sh can be discussed separately. My objective is to have a look at the sources which worked before and to think which of them can work, uh, let's say, for a long term, uh, short, medium term perspectives of three, five years. First, I will review the situation in the Russian economy in terms of the global perspective roughly we'll see that some periods of economic growth coincided with the growth of global economy and some periods russia had its own path we'll see the difference between uh, different way, modes of productivity and then i'll speak about russian economies individually uh, the general approach related to extensive and intensive sources of growth is applicable to the level of economy on the whole and at the level of uh, separate industry and transfer from some industries to economy on the whole uh, is also related to uh, structural shifts aggregated labor productivity can increase or decrease 
depending on allocation of resources in time. Uh, I will uh, look at the structural shifts and then I'll uh, speak in detail about sources of productivity growth within industries. At the end, it will be necessary to select important aspects which can be considered in the future for planning and developing economic uh, policy. The uh, report should be of practical value. And the matters of data methodology will not be taken much consideration in my presentation, but I'll briefly mention the general approach for making these calculations. This methodology uh, is based on the accounts of economic growth uh, originated from solo or paper of 1957. Uh, these accounts of economic growth, they fit in the system of economic accounts. Jorgensen had all continued solos work. They expanded this theoretical framework to have the capacity to analyze economic growth sources, not only at the level of the economy in the whole, but to analyze the contribution of specific uh, industries and production fact factors in specific industries uh, within the context of uh, global uh, labor productivity growth. Accounts of economic growth can answer the question, what's the contribution of the capital related to information and communication technologies in business services to the aggregated uh, labor productivity growth? And what's the contribution of buildings and structures in agriculture to aggregated productivity growth? An important peculiarity of accounts of economic growth in the system is direct uh, in relation to GDP growth. Uh, Yevsey Gurvich mentioned that at the conference there were several presentations related to productivity. Yuri Simachov gave the presentation and in the literature, including the Russian literature, there are many studies considering some aspects of labor productivity growth at the level of individual companies. These studies are good, they, but they do not provide the overall picture for all industries of economy. They do not enable to state that sources of labor productivity growth in for example, uh, these sectors, uh, they impact the economy uh, in general in this and that way. Uh, in this uh, respect, uh, this report is a global view. It's not detailed maybe, but it covers the economy on the whole. There are two sources. Uh, the report is based on uh, them. Uh, the two sources uh, originated from uh, John Genson work. This is a uh, database developed by analytical uh, entity conference board, includes uh, data for 122 economies based in on the classic approach of accounts of economic growth. It decomposes growth in a number of factors but this database provides macro view at the level of economy. On the whole, it's important to be able to analyze not only economy on the whole, but uh, individual industries and factors inside these industries. And for that purpose, we use Russia Clams uh, database. It enables to compare sources of labor productivity growth in individual industries within a big group of countries. 
but uh, we use this data of Russia claims only in order to see the sources of productivity within industries better and to analyze uh, relations between industries, connections between them. Russian system of national accounts does not uh, provide long the uh, rows uh, of uh, productivity factors. So we need a longer uh, uh, database. But nevertheless, some um, issues related to methodology, related to data, these are uh, general uh, questions to the Russian system of national accounts and its uh, state. One more uh, issue is issue of breaking down into sectors and industries. In Russia, perhaps we can uh, use uh, 34 uh, types of uh, uh, work. Uh, these industries are too many. We need some less detailed aggregation. This late, uh, less detailed aggregation is represented on the slide. We start from the standard classification, agriculture, industries, uh, and services, but in today's economy is developed uh, service sector. It's necessary to understand that subsectors, different subsectors of service sector, for example, can have different uh, uh, behavior pattern. Jorgensen, for example, showed it uh, very well for the countries of OECD. So we divide uh, services into two groups, uh, finance services and business services, and other uh, services which include retail, freight and particular communications, restaurants, hotels, taking into account the special role of mining industries in Russian economy, we singled out uh, mining sector. So this is uh, production and uh, processing and wholesale trade, uh, three f f types. Uh, this uh, indicates the share of uh, mining industry. I refer to uh, the paper by Yusei Gulrich of 2004 and the work of the colleagues from World Bank and the work of uh, other uh, colleagues which dealt with these uh, issues and non-market sector in this work. I will not uh, touch upon the non-market uh, sector as such. Uh, the difference of productivity, labor productivity uh, in non-market sector um, is difficult to identify because of the methodological issues related to the system of national accounts non-market sector measures uh, the output using the costs uh, uh, indicator. Labor productivity, of course, is proportion of the output to cost and uh, regarding non-market sector, it's ratio of cost to cost, uh, which reflects not uh, efficiency, uh, but uh, different calculations uh, during estimation of non-market sector. This is uh, the general approach. Uh, so our first step, Russia, uh, in terms of uh, uh, prospect uh, uh, between industries, inter-industrial perspective. Uh, Russian economy experienced uh, two crises. They are demonstrated here. Uh, you can see from 1990 to 
2000, Russia, as many countries with transitional economy, has its own path. It was transformational recession from 2002 to 2011. There was more or less homogeneous uh, uniform growth in these years, Russian economy demonstrated high uh, growth pace comparable to developing uh, uh, and forming markets in this diagram. You can see it in red. You can see that the trend of the output of the developed countries of OECD economies is uh, much more conservative here. And it is seen here that in 2002, 2007, Russia was growing in the same pattern as the developing markets. It was a period when BRIC abbreviation uh, was originated. And we'll, we'll consider in this period of stationary pathway. And another period started uh, from 2011, it's a stagnation period for Russia. It, in some respect, it's a stagnation period for other global economies. It's a general pattern, uh, part of a general pattern called global uh, slowdown of labor productivity, but the countries had different patterns of slowdown, developed economies slowed down a bit uh, more, developing economies uh, slow down a bit less, but slow down for Russia looks uh, quite big. The growth space of the Russian economy from 2011 to 2016 were about 0.8%. It's even lower than the growth space in OECD countries, not mentioned in developing markets. I will use this period from 2002 to 2007 and from 2011 to 2016 for methodological reason uh, regarding total factor productivity. This uh, uh, value is sensitive to measurements and this sensitivity is related to not a precise assessment of capital at the stage of shock. So I will use the periods where there are no shocks from 2002 to 2007 and from 2011 to 2016. You can see in a dotted line in this diagram this uh, segment which will be used uh, for uh, average assessment. I mentioned uh, extensive and intensive growth components. Why is it important in Russia? Uh, labor productivity growth is mentioned a lot in scientific literature, in political discussions, we, programs are developed, we have a national project called labor productivity. Labor productivity includes not only intensive component related to enhancement of production efficiency, also it includes extensive component which all includes the capital intensity. You can see a growth space for labor productivity for OECD countries on the left and on the right you can see total factor productivity total factor productivity grows when uh, production costs uh, go down well in this uh, uh, diagram we can see that uh, the growth of labor productivity is not equal to the growth of total factor productivity. The growth of labor productivity does not always mean reduction of production costs. Uh, in the left we can see labor productivity, in the right we can see 
uh, total factor productivity for the global economy and for ECD, the uh, pace of uh, labor productivity growth was higher than total factor productivity. When we speak about global slowdown, it's loss for economy to decrease uh, production costs. So we can see total factor productivity reduces in all countries after the crisis of 2008. An important question for us, to what extent this reduction is related to the global processes or, or in the economy and to what component of this reduction relates to the peculiarities of Russian economy. I will mention the causes of reduction of total factor productivity in Russia uh, within industries. Uh, you can see this trend uh, applicable to the Russian economy. The total pattern is similar. This uh, slide shows uh, the, the trends of growth components uh, within industries. So we can, when we, we decompose uh, economic growth on the whole, we don't uh, consider the fact that different industries grow with different productivity. We don't take into account the fact that there are different factors in different industries contributing to the growth. If we focus on the sector of market services, we will see the pattern like that. In blue, you can see extensive components of growth, capital intensity, and green, you can see aggregate total factor productivity, which reflects the capacity of the economy to reduce costs. The slide shows the labor productivity, which we pay a lot of attention, was growing steadily throughout the entire period, except maybe the recent years. The growth space started slowing down after 2013. We will see the total factor productivity started slowing down in the Russian economy much earlier, much earlier than the crisis of 2008 occurred. So, uh, growth of Russian economy is the uh, interaction of these two components. In the first place, it's effectiveness, so total factor productivity. More detailed decomposition of the sources of the labor productivity growth in Russia uh, shows very well different uh, components of the growth and the interaction between them. You can see the uh, growth space of uh, labor productivity here. Uh, labor productivity was accelerating until 2007 and then gradual slowing down uh, started. We can see that at the acceleration stage there was a great role of total factor productivity during the recession. Uh, the uh, capital intensity role was not noticeable uh, from 2002 to 2007. We can see the uh, growing role of um, capital intensity. At the last stage, at the stagnation stage, we can see that uh, uh, capital intensity is the only as the most significant growth of labor productivity growth. And uh, uh, during stagnation period, uh, compared to uh, well-being years of 2002-2007, uh, the role of capital intensity is high. Uh, during this period, 2002-2007, uh, we heard a lot that we are dependent on oil too much, we have extensive growth, but after 2007, we've had even more extensive growth. 
there are other factors for uh, labor productivity growth, which might not be that significant, but they are shown in this uh, diagram, but in some industries, these factors can be significant. First is relocation of labor. I will mention about it in more detail. And the quality of labor force, uh, relocation of labor is related to acceleration or slowing down of aggregated productivity depending on allocation of workforce. If uh, workforce is uh, work hours are distributed in favor of more uh, productive sectors, it, uh, labor productivity uh, effect uh, will, will be positive and vice versa. Uh, the point related to the quality of uh, workforce is looks similar. It relates to relocation of working hours between different uh, workers with different productivity. Relocation of working hours in favor of more productive and experienced workers causes uh, uh, higher quality of workforce per working hour. You can see that the uh, impact of relocation is slowing down, but the impact of uh, quality of workforce is stable, but it's relatively small from uh, 0 to 0 0.4 uh, percent. Structural shifts is an important component of the Russian uh, productivity growth. A lot of literature exists about structural shifts, but this paper stresses the role of structural shifts on economic uh, growth. Structural shifts can be measured by the share of work towers in a Russian economy and by the share of added value. Both ways grasp general trends in generally the same, but uh, in terms of working hours, non market sector is stable and we can see a gradual uh, reduction of processing industries from 90% of working time in 1995 to 14% in 2016. We can see intensive reduction of working hours in agriculture. It relates to a reduction of the number of working hours in a personal uh, kitchen gardens. We see small growth in financial services and business services, small growth in mining industries and extending uh, mining industries. But in terms of effects of relocation, it's important to see the relative distribution of the level of labor productivity between sectors and the changes of it. If uh, the spread is big, even a minor relocation of working hours can produce big relocation effect. If the spread is small, even intensive relocation of workforce cannot provide good outcomes. Uh, in this diagram, you can see the relative level of different sectors in 1995 and 2016 in relation to the mean in the economy, the ratio of nominal uh, value, uh, added value to uh, working hours. We can see that the total uh, uh, variety regarding uh, productivity level in the sectors is gradually reducing this variation. So. Uh, the general trend uh, GDP per capita in Russia is growing and we can see that the spread of the productivity levels in the industries is reducing. Also, we can see that the changes in the relative uh, labor productivity is different in different sectors. 
we cannot consider, for example, as I mentioned, services as a one big sector. This uh, diagram demonstrates well why we can't. It's sufficient to compare finance services, for example, and construction, trade, and telecommunications. In 2018, these two groups were at the same level of labor productivity, but in the recent five years, there has been a revolution in finance services, uh, significant changes in uh, uh, implementation of technologies contributed to the uh, behavior of customers changed. It, it did not happen in construction, trade, and telecommunications to that extent. So we can see the trends absolutely different now in terms of productivity of labor. You can see uh, if the uh, agriculture, if the uh, level uh, is uh, similar uh, of the structural shifts, it uh, does not mean that the labor productivity did not grow. It really has grown. What's the uh, effects of labor uh, reallocation? It's shown in dark blue here. From 1995 to 2002, the impacts of labor relocation was significant, then it reduced, and in the recent year, uh, it became a bit more significant. So, at the initial stage, uh, some disproportions of planned economy were removed, and we could see high contribution of labor. Uh, reallocation, it's like breaks through a uh, contribution of labor reallocation. Uh, if you see the papers of Brown, for example, studied the early period of transition to the market economy, and then they uh, showed the gradual decrease at the later stages. So uh, the hopes for uh, uh, good outcomes uh, related to structural shifts cannot be that high because the uh, gap of uh, productivity is decreasing related to that. Uh, now, when we spoke about uh, relocation between industries and we understood that relocation between industries is not a reliable source of long-term growth, we can consider in more detail the sources between industries. They play a bigger role in long-term growth of Russian economy. The first step I'd like to make to speak about the sources in, within industries, to, we should speak about total factor productivity. Many papers are written, they state that total factor productivity in stagnation period in Russian economy goes down. But this diagram shows the growth space of total factor productivity if we look at the contribution of different sectors. This diagram answers the question at expense of what sectors total factor productivity goes down in the Russian economy. We can see here six uh, uh, fundamental sectors of the Russian economy and the main sector in Russia, you can see extended mining industries shown in red. The uh, de decline in terms of total factor productivity for the mining industry, it explains the negative trends in our economic growth. Naturally, we can see the details. If we compare the period of 2002-2007 uh, and period 2011-2016, we can see the decline XP happened in other services, in transport, in processing industries, Although currently, despite the horrible situation of stagnation, uh, there uh, has not been uh, 
big decline in uh, processing industry, but the first, uh, the leader in uh, decline is the extended mining industry. So we cannot see that when we uh, operate with labor productivity instead of total factor productivity. And uh, the next point, capital intensity. What uh, can we say about the extensive component? The extensive component in Russian economy has a stable growth. It grows in the crisis from 2007 to 2011. It grew even at a higher pace, but it's, uh, there are some issues related to calculating here regarding inventory calculation, but we can see that during transformation, a recession from 1995 to 2002, the capital intensity flow was negative. And Russian claims database gives a better explanation. Uh, accounts for that better. We can speak about the quality of the assessment of capital intensity within this system, but this diagram uh, shows one important uh, result. During the stagnation period, the uh, role of the active uh, uh, part of the uh, main capital it decreased in its role, but uh, in the period from 2011-2016, this uh, capital uh, had a greater role. We can see the role of um, information and communication capital shown in red here. I, uh, of course, our assessments are quite vulnerable. Uh, I am not speaking about the quality of measurement. It's a sensitive issue, but we can see that the role of ICT capital contribution to the growth has been reducing, not only in Russia. On global scale, there is the same trend. I, I am not saying that uh, using digital technologies is bad for growth, but I can say it's not the key for economic growth. If we consider uh, how capital intensity reveals itself in the best way in which sector we can see extended mining sector is the leader. Its capital extensive sector, it also can attract a part of investment resources due to rent. And uh, the last point I'd like to consider, I understand that I'm running out of time. I need three more minutes to finish. The last point, it's a human capital. Last but not least, the system of accounts of economic growth enables to take into account the quality of workforce. Dennis, in its, his paper of 1962, integrated this approach to the system of economic growth and to what it gave us for understanding of the economic growth in Russia. First, in this diagram, on the left, the left diagram shows the shares of working hours for different workers with different level of education. Low skills are uh, workers with uh, incomplete secondary education, red is uh, secondary education, green incomplete uh, high education. And we can see some, we can see some phenomena. That we see from other data, other in points. the Russian labor market, in Russia, there is labor market. There's a gradual, uh, gradual washing away of uh, low-skill labor. What we don't 
C is the contribution, so C which is the construction contribution of this basis, reconstruction to the growth the space increasing in general. Productivity. So what is the gain of labor services from the fact that a number of hours worked is distributed in favor of uh, more productive labor? So the picture is clearly, the picture on the left is calculated for 18 groups. Uh, it's obviously stable, positive. Uh, contribution of the increasing labor productivity is due to higher level of education of labor. So positive growth in favor of more productive. Overall, the contribution to higher productivity, we see here the percentage is higher, but if you multiply it by a share of labor costs, the overall uh, increase in labor productivity is not so great. Uh, the same as age, we see that population is aging. We see that population is a are aging. But we also see that a positive contribution through the quality of labor is mostly due to hours worked in at uh, 50 plus and less so at 40, at 25 to 49. This to do with the fact that those that have survived on the labor market, people who are older age, they survived because they have experience, skills, and know how to work. So this picture that does not show those who have left the uh, labor market at this age. So what are the conclusions? On this table, I put together what, what we could pick up from the overall analysis of the previous rapid growth whilst uh, during the period of uh, rapid growth um, until the year 20, 2007, this growth cons was constituted by capital intensity in, in the mining industry, technological catching up in industry, agriculture, business services, whilst we were seeing certain structural bonus as far as these com components. But, uh, after the year 2008, many of these sources disappeared. What, what, what remained was capital intensity of mining industry, also successful agriculture and business services, and human capital, even though its contribution is not so great. And that's all that remains. So what's, what are we in for after the year 2020? What do we to expect? If we proceed from this inertia type of, outlook on the Russian economy, not much. There's a, the mining uh, industry, capital intensity will be, will be effective, but we need to do something about uh, overall effectiveness. There'll be still contribution of, of human capital. Well, let me conclude, half a minute is left, just as long as I need to, to say why there's some shortcomings to this report. There's never time enough for shortcomings and downside. The picture we painted here is what we're able to squeeze out, what we're able to do ourselves, and what we're able to squeeze out of the Russian reporting system. What we don't see, and we, we know this, our, is the limitation of the accounts of uh, economic growth. Uh, there's no direct international industries. Also, after 2017, we didn't show the picture after 2017. We don't show the dynamics of total factor productivity, not in the oil industry in Russia or in other countries, which would be interesting and we, we, could, we could do it. There are also matters that require deeper study of the existing Rush methodology. The first thing I'm concerned about is incomplete transparency of the official indices of prices, uh, from outputs, uh, indices, indices of output, in the particular to do with mining industries. Not quite clear methodologically 
whether this index is neutral to supposed to be neutral to leaps in the dollar exchange rate and indicators of gross cap accumulation of the capital we don't quite understand what uh, this what is the structure of the costs of oil and gas industry there may be some natural causes uh, to do with the changes of age uh, aging stru structure so the older stuff may be more expensive to sell so we don't see all the costs of oil and gas we don't understand the role of ta regulation of tariffs in our industry also the distortion of transfer pricing because of a rich configuration that's one of our headaches but still the effect of the drop of total fa f factor productivity in oil and gas is quite large enough for us to pay attention to this sector the errors of measurement which i'm sure there are many of these of which there are many basically they're applicable to all industries so the question is why in the extent oil and gas industry those errors may may relate to the lowering total factor productivity we need to have numerical arguments to, it's not just stating that it's something we're not doing right and as far as the sources of growth the sources are confirmed by previous experience in russian history the economic growth and its sources the more obvious ones are reduction of costs in extended oil and gas let me skip uh, stimulation of growth that will be repeated what i've been saying uh, so thank you thank you very much very highly uh, substantive and very vivid report some of the conclusions look quite shocking actually so there may be quite a lot of questions but we did agree that we'll have questions towards the end of the session first i'd like to give the floor to Alexander Zhirov from the Academy of Sciences uh, Forecasting Entity. Yes, hello. I'm not an opponent, I'm the one to, to discuss it. Uh, actually, I'd like to congratulate my colleagues with this report, but indeed, the problem is as far as such structure reach uh pieces of uh, research uh, that look uh, that take a comprehensive view that clearly a shortage of such uh, uh, studies so this structural com component is is often overlooked uh, and that uh, does not make economic economic policy in this country more effective uh, So, my presentation, which I prepared as part of this discussion, consists of two parts. First are the matters of productivity and estimation of its impact on economic dynamics. And the second is the case that Ilya Borisovich touched upon about the gas sector. Indeed, the conclusions uh, that are important in the report they're clear it's clear how they actually made but one would like to look at this matter from slightly different angle to get this kind of synergy synergy if you think back to the history of your institute institute of national economy the founder uh academic in shishkin alexander shishkin he mostly looked at the economy as through as a set of production functions. Uh, so, uh, Irrigan did macro analysis, uh, tables of outputs. That was his. So, the synergy of these two methods made it possible to come up with interesting, structurally interesting results. 
back in the Soviet and later during the Russian, uh, the times of early Russia. As far as the way we look at the impact of structural factors on the economy, this story, the period of development of our economy last 30 years is the story of, of the structural shock in 1990s, which was the drop of G GNP that caused uh, led to the restructuring. Uh, so less effective uh, kinds of production uh, dropped out and the overall level of production increased. So as a result, between the years 1999-2007, relatively effective enterprises with a high level of efficiency, they were able to to count on quick, uh, increasing quickly income from the economic activities because the good opportunities on the international market. So as far as the oil and other commodities. And, but around the year 2005, this share of real sector of the economy to do with the increasing efficiency, that period ended and the stagnation we found ourselves in was that uh, the increasing factors increasing efficiency after 1999 they uh, were exhausted uh, so if you look at the at this graph the economy of the last 40 years maybe the structural shifts were minimal but the pace of growth was minimal too were they to grow, we would likely get more intensive uh, dynamics. And uh, could be more positive than uh, that what we got after 2000, 2007. So the structural factors, much driven by structural changes. So if there's such shifts, if there are no such shifts because of investment or other factors, then we stand to lose uh, potential of growth. Besides what was shown in the report, we look at the indicators for the efficiency of use of resources, of primary resources. Clearly, if we can use a unit of primary resources to convert it into a certain uh, amount of added value, that makes the whole process more, more efficient. On the one hand, it's the same thing as a total factor productivity, but, there's, but it has no structure of costs. So from this angle, it's a, it's a standpoint of specialists who mostly rely on tables. So compared to the 1980, we can see, which was back in the Soviet time, productivity, total productivity factor increased uh, uh, a lot, but the actual, but the actual efficiency of the economy as a whole fell about 32 percent. The connected economy. So here we're talking, of course, about added value cooperation. If there were no such fall, then definitely the potential growth of our economy would have been much higher. Among other things, we're trying to look at these factors, as is shown here, which enables us to, to look at the factors of components of economic growth in terms of quality and quantity. If it's thanks to the greater amount of resources, that's that's not quality, but if it's great efficiency and greater returns for a unit uh, uh, input, uh, then we get more effective economy. Now, as far as productivity, our view is that there's a, a robust uh, connection between time worked and the change in the structure of production. Change in structure of production, there's certain, here we mean certain indicators. This curve, we can see that uh, those indicators, it would appear between parameters of effectiveness of production and productivity, 
and structural shifts in a certain connection there, which we are trying to, to trace and to highlight. Now I'm moving to, to the item which uh, took a serious place in this report, which I think is quite important. It's what to do with the mine. It's what's happening with the mining industry. My colleague Andrei Kapokov and myself, we looked at, at what we feel is important in terms of analysis of efficiency, efficiency accounting of oil sector. If we look at the key growth factors here, we see that the conditions of production of oil and gas are deteriorating. Efficiency of production as far as the use of technology, that's definitely is improving. But the market uh, conditions, it's uh, highly volatile. Over the last 10, 15 years, there's have seen several cycles of ups and downs, which has a lot of uh, impact on how we might estimate the efficiency of oil and gas. What? What I would like to say about this problem, one of the key problems to it would appear is that the report doesn't cover the best period of time. The estimations ends at 2016 and the left hand graphs shows that the minimum value of the parameters of efficiency oil and gas sector over the last five years. If you go back to, to the right hand graph, then this fall of effectiveness in 2016 is practically offset by the phase in 2016-2018, where which our country basically didn't much notice. There was no real reflection as dynamics on GNP. So what I'm saying, if you look at all this long line of facts and look at the story of from 2016-2019, this whole thing, story could have been adjusted substantially. Even though, of course, you can, you may work with data that you, that's available. If you look at the effectiveness, what can you say? First of all, it's high in contribution to economic dynamics. It's, it's a fact of the permanent growth of income. The steady uh, permanent growth suggests that A, we can put uh, new wells into operation quickly. On the other hand, uh, the price for oil grows. Clearly, they don't no such combination anymore which means the model itself, the conditions of the, of the sector have changed uh, uh, drastically. So this whole sector, mining sector overall is no longer the drive, the driver of economic growth. It's the base of economic growth now. So as far as where do we got to get a uh, gain of GNP from the mining sector? It will be pr primarily small, but still increase in, in amount of production. A second is indirect factors to do with increasing demand for, for the end products. Because if you increase production of oil, production of oil by 17% in 2016, 2017, the investment per oil increased by almost 50%. So if you look at uh, that exploitation, it increased by almost 100%. So actually, it's clear that in, in current conditions, despite the fact that the effectiveness has decreased, the, in, the contribution of oil gas towards dynamics of growth, 2016, 2016, particularly in 2018, if we look, it's up to 75% uh, as far as the output of new output of, manu, of industrial manufacturing. So a large portion of the increase in the GNP is due to this. The analysis made based on the data that you use, 
Now, there's some, I would say, paradox, some, mis some mystery or a special feature, I would say, as far as the oil and gas uh, complex. If you look at the graph on the left hand, we see, we'll see on the one hand, we get this cross where the increase of output per well was, go was, was going down. But the overall efficiency was increasing. We see that in 2012, 2015, things became fairly stable. Despite the overall deterioration of characteristics, because of the use of new technologies on a large scale, as, as we can see here, horizontal drilling in particular. So we got st stabilization uh, of, let's say, technological factors, you might say, economical factors. So what was done enable this sector to, to maintain its role as the base for the development of economy. And finally, interesting special feature here. The costs in the oil and gas complex for the development, for service, for, for exploration. Uh, above the... Uh, you wouldn't think it relates to the price for oil because this is just a set of material costs. But in real life, we see that there's great uh, connection between prices for auxiliary services, even in oil and gas production, and these parameters. That probably also goes to distort what we see, the additional factors So that's so we get extra problems from this. What I want to say, in, to sum up, structurally speaking, our economy is very rich, where there are lots of fairly complex uh, industry and inter industry connections. So clearly, if it's just one look, uh, production functions or costs, that's not enough to get a full understanding what the problem might be of a particular sector, whether it's effective or not effective, or whether it's objective or subjective assessment, what are the factors behind it. And actually, my position here is that one should gradually uh, do comprehensive studies, whether it's uh, the whole gas and oil sector or separate sectors in processing maybe industry. So one can look at them from above through production functions or the level of microeconomics. Because when we make decisions, I mean, the government takes decisions, executive, to develop particular sectors of the economy, this kind of analysis is never, never never made, it's typically all based on uh, inter-industry uh, relations, how they interact with each other. But basically in the short and medium term, the industry factors, the factors of shifts uh, might be key in uh, formulating uh, industrial policy. Thank you. Once again, I want to congratulate you on the quality of your work. Thank you. I agree with the... One does need comprehensive uh, studies. What one could add more aspects to the list you've mentioned, aspects of study. When you spoke of extended oil mining sector, but you also have gas industry, which of course much smaller than oil oil production, oil processing, but still quite significant uh, in terms of its uh, contribution to the GMP. And uh, one can could look not not just at macro or microeconomic uh, indicators. But the efficiency, I think, is also determined by selection of projects. Uh, whether the projects that uh, the industry were effective, 
or maybe it was the case of the wrong assessment of the future prices. Uh, as we agreed, we're moving to questions now. Um, so those who have questions. Uh, no questions. Ah, yes. Erzan Zaitsev. Good day to all. Uh, more than once, in, 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 in his report said that uh, capital intensity is an extensive factor. So if there's an investment in the industry which in, increases capital intensity, if we analyze not the dynamics of productivity, but the level of productivity in Russian companies, uh, compared to other countries. For example, uh, three time lagging in, uh, of Russia in way productivity from US, 50%, that's actually the total factor of productivity. And the other 50% maybe is due to the fact that our capital intensity in Russia is lower. Or, or maybe if some industry as automation or mechanization of manufacturing. And if it's done uh, from investment, shall we, shall we call this the growth of productivity as extensive? That's the first question. The second question, to do with the interpretation of the total factor of productivity. It would appear, based on your analysis, we see that in those industries, where in the last years they have seen positive investment dynamics. I'm not even speaking of oil, gas, or oil processing. Even if it's retail, where there's positive dynamics in finances or telecoms, it's those sectors that have positive dynamics, they also have the biggest slump in total factor productivity. And that suggests, actually. So what, what is it about? Investment made, but because Russian economy is in stagnation, those investments have yet to pay off. So in this connection, can, can you speak of these industries as negative contribution towards total factor productivity? It's a natural process in those industries. So, so far, productivity labor is due to investment. Uh, the increases due to investment. So as the industries uh, develop, uh, they create basis for future growth, uh, such as uh, will be covered by total factor productivity. No. So what are the rules? Do we first collect questions and answer them, or do we answer the questions as we go along? So towards uh, the conclusion, I will say a few words about Alexander Shurev's comment. Uh, but now let's address questions. Point one. Extensive and intensive growth. It's a question of definition. The definition is quite simple. The growth is called extensive if it's uh, driven by uh, factors of costs. If we see economic growth uh, due to investments in any kind of form or shape, uh, progressive or, or wonderful, it's still in this kind of system, it's, it's still extensive growth. And the other way around, if the growth is uh, it takes place given that the level of costs is the same, that's intensive. Maybe one should clarify two points here. That concerns this question as well. And the second question in some way, I would not uh, try to color words extensively intensive by words. Uh, that's the main thing. This is the answer to the first question. If we see uh, the, the predominance of uh, 
holding back costs, it's intensive, but if we see the predominance of capital intensity or other factors, it's, in, it's in intensive growth. But, but I'm not saying whether it's anything good or bad. That's a separate story. Actually, it also gives a, provides an answer to the second question. What are you saying that some sectors, such as retail, that show positive dynamics where they actually invest, but they, but they, but they have no uh, total factor productivity. I actually see no contradiction here. All I see here is the fact that in these industries, the growth today is due to additional costs. Uh, in the longer term, and we, we draw a different kind of trajectory, 10 years from now, we might see increase in total factor productivity. But if we take away this connection, intensive, good, uh, extensive, bad, then everything falls into place uh, and makes sense. The fact that retail today falls through as far as total factor productivity, that's my statement, and your statement that there may be capital intensity that whose consequence you will only see 10 years from now. They don't contradict each other, don't run counter each other. But if retail continues to fall through 10 years from now, that probably would call for a different explanation. Alexander, sure. uh, two questions, or maybe one question. First question. What do you think? If in investments are in non-material assets, can we see them as expensive ones? Or is it an intensive tendency? Second question. In your studies, did you try to estimate the contribution of uh, non-material assets into the growth of productivity? Uh, thank you. Uh, can I answer? Non-material assets and an extensive and intensive part. The direct answer to your question is, would be such. If we look at uh, non-material assets as part of capital, then the cost of non-material uh, assets is part of extensive growth. But uh, in the studies and in our system, non-material uh, assets are also presented, even though in the existing CLEMS version, non-material assets are counted for in a very limited way. If you want to analyze long uh, fact line for factors, we need to rely on statistics that's, that's been more or less available over the last 20 years. So as far as non-material uh, assets here are uh, Capabilities are very much limited, so we're trying to, to re readjust, trying to use the indicators of the fixed assets as uh, such a software uh, support. So we don't have much here. So we're working on this. As far as, besides the main contribution of material assets into the capital intensity in modern studies on uh, non material assets, there's also calculation, it's an assumption that non-material assets in themselves are forming part of the output and some part of the output may not be, may not fit into the standard measures and be expanded. So one should think that we we'll need to look at role of non-material assets, not only as far as cost, but also as far as the output, but in the existing claims version, we are not seeing this. Or, or at least we don't include it into the overall category, but we're working on to, to, to correct allowing for non-materials assets and also part to do with costs, uh, capital services. So I've addressed this uh, in this way. Any more questions? Thank you very much for the chance to ask question. When you, when we looked at CLEM, CLEMS in quite detail, I remember we looked at the calculation of the quality of labor. So low skill, high skills. You know. So we calculate coefficients and ratios for different countries, which kind of labor uh, gives better, bigger contribution. And we've got some averages. But the interesting thing uh, transpired. So calculations made based on the education, dip, the diplomas as far as statistics as far as the quality of labor. Here in Russia, 
There's a fairly large co cohort of people I'm, I'm aware of who hold low paid jobs, but actually holding uh, diplomas in high, of, of high education. According to statistics, they end up in the category of highly qualified people, but, if, but in fact, they're doing low quality jobs, low pay, low skill. So, so in terms of uh, labor, they're much under, underpaid. They could uh, pursue far more productive labor with high, much higher pay, but they're not, but there's no such, uh, but they're not holding su that such jobs. So this gap between percentage of lab labor, uh, different, different estimates of labor, different estimates, especially uh, as far as people who do low skilled jobs. How do you cover this gap and what should be the reserve? Thank you very much, Anton, good question. It falls into two aspects. First, measuring, second, uh, substance and content. As far as measuring, uh, it's what we see as far as the quality of labor, the price of increasing the number of hours worked in separate groups, weighed, weighted ideally to the share in the pay of this group. So in this sense, if a person holding a high degree of education does low skill work and we see this person's wages, basically this person, we see this effect of measuring. So no problem as far as theory. I mean, it's all one to us. What kind of diploma, what kind of university, what's important is what kind of wage this person is paid in, ter in terms of, to assess this person's productivity. But if uh, when we say that a person with uh, high knowledge and skills does uh, low skill work, what can, what can be done about this? I can just shrug my shoulders and say, I don't know, because what you're uh, talking about is the problem of mismatch of skills. So the matching of a mismatch of skills and knowledge and the job, we looking at the diploma of a worker we cannot say to what extent the market today may have demand for such knowledge and skills. The, either the problem is that the employer failed to find this worker with brilliant knowledge and skills, or maybe the, the problem is that uh, the, this worker has skills and knowledge, but there may be other characteristics, maybe bad character or not able to get along with other people. Uh, that, prevent the person from uh, realizing this knowledge and, and these skills. Well, I can put it this way. We see the contribution of this component. We understand this, the problem of skill mismatch, and mismatch between knowledge and skills and workplace. And this problem is not just problem in Russia, it's quite global skills mismatch is one of the causes, one of the reasons that uh, the exp used to explain the global slowdown, but what to do about this? I'm not the specialist in, in this kind of market. Maybe we should talk to people who are closer to the ground. Uh, yes, Igor Nikolaevich. But yes, let's go this way. Но такие right. слова прозвучали, да, but, про but, вот все было хорошо, я полностью бы согласился, good, если бы я одно, а, а это но упомянутое в названии part, доклада, вот это вот отсылка актуальности сегодняшнего дня, вот это упоминание о кризисе. Uh, and the mention of the virus crisis, all those inertial factors, momentum, when such things are happening, uh, uh, I should think, I would have, I would have been cautious not to speak of the inertial scenario in this connection. I'll, I'll put it this way. I do agree with the 
As we look at our economy a year from now, at our global, Russian economy as well as global economy, many things may, uh, will have likely changed that we can't even imagine now. I completely agree. But, uh, but here and now, can take into account the information we have, we need to try and uh, look, think forward about the future. So in this sense, what we can see really, unless we do some scenario-based calculations and to make some projections of the future, we can look into the past and see what which uh, source of growth from the past might survive. Well, what I would like to draw attention to one particular point. My, the point. The point of my report was not to to paint the scenario of the future. It's not my work. I don't know how to do it. Even among our listeners, there are lots of people who know how to do it better than we do. My job is to look at the longer term uh, uh, growth sources of the last 20 years and to say which of these may, may survive. That's not to rule out that new ones might emerge tomorrow. But I'm afraid that in the course of these 20 years, we've seen the reaction of the Russian economy in positive or negative sense uh, as a reaction of the oil and gas industries to global shocks. We saw that this particular reaction in many ways, not in everything, but in many ways, uh, affected our growth, and which is what we can hope for in the nearest future. And here I agree with you alongside other factors which we may not be able to see now. I understand there are no more questions. I'm afraid that we don't have much any time left for discussion. So if, uh, unless the, anybody insists on com commenting, if not, I want to give uh, the floor for the final words to Barisich. Yes, there's also Alexander Rubinstein. I simply would like to say a few words. Uh, first, uh, we heard a wonderful report, very interesting, on many points, simply uh, revealing a whole number of phenomena that were not so known perhaps in the before. And one of the important points, in the recent times, there have been lots of reports and speeches at conferences uh, in the context of coron coronavirus, where all kinds of fantasies uh, were described. So wonderful uh, critique of this report. There's no such uh, fantasy. It's really a study of dynamics and attempt to understand the fun, fundamental factors that one may hope will be effective in the future too. So this will be at play in the future. One thing I, I felt was missing for me, but that's maybe as far as fantasy. Maybe at least as far as the past time, especially the ideology claims is aiming at this, would be an attempt to take into account of material assets. Of course, I would like to get a sense of the possible contribution towards the development of economy, to, to the economic growth and productivity growth. Such fundamental phenomena as fundamental science, which is really uh, a big amount of such non-material assets. Otherwise, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. All right, Rabbi uh, welcome. I'll try to make a very short comment uh, uh, devoted to the comments by Alexander. I want to thank, I must thank Alexander. I think it's, it's the kind of view that our work does not have. It's a look some from different uh, side, from the side of structural changes. Alexander, having appreciated that the focus of the work is on um, oil and gas uh, industry, came up with lots of uh, quite a few arguments that I would have to think about now. First, I completely agree with the fact that we need to include the period between 2016, 2019, and the fact it was not included, it's uh, it is because of our paucity, we'll do that. Uh, uh, of course, it needs to be done, no, no doubt about that. And also your comment uh, that you made earlier at this seminar, we, need, we should have some price dynamics uh, T, TF, TFP for, for production industries, those production industries that uh, provide uh, com commodities for global markets. They also ex experience these shocks and the demand grows. 
conditions for production, something I don't know much about, but what you were telling us, of course, I'll need to read carefully your commentary and your, your, and your works, works by yourself, your colleagues, and that, that we need to understand to what extent the change of conditions of production, uh, to what extent they affect uh, the effectiveness of oil and gas industries. And in these conditions of productions, what were the objective realities and were the effects, effectiveness that can be increased? It's a big question and it's a challenge to the oil industry in particular. And the fact that that's another of your comments. The in technological improvements uh, change the situation in oil and gas complex and the, the effectiveness was better, right there. If uh, technological, if technological component uh, uh, in the oil gas industry would have been different, of course, there would be more effects uh, if more effectiveness, if there had been. So, so what they're telling us, it reflects really well technological effectiveness, what's, uh, what more, what uh, missing. And we're improving effectiveness but we don't understand what are the bottlenecks. You may have one machines, but the worker cable of working of those machines may be too expensive. Uh, may, so hypothetically saying maybe one would do, one could do better just holding on to the old machines. Because it's not about machines alone, it's about workers, people, uh, capable of using them. I find very interesting uh, the point about uh, costs relating to the oil prices that you spoke of. Maybe it's, it, it may be connected with investment decisions that uh, um, I need, I'll need to look at it uh, and figure it out. It may be that if the high oil prices, there might be easier investment decisions for new technology, but the investor is more concerned about oil prices, more likely to, uh, to say no to a project. But let me, I want to thank you once again. I believe that it's the beginning of a dialogue that from different sides uh, should uh, uh, shed light on this problem. It's important that we start to talk about this. Today we're discussing economic growth in this way, where the, it has a base. What I really like to distinguish in a driver versus base. Uh, uh, oil and gas used to be driver for growth. Now it's become a base. In the situation where it's a base, uh, one should stop and think how to make it even bigger and better. Do you want to say anything in conclusion? No, once again, I want to thank uh, as the person, uh, participant in discussion. I think, I hope it will, will, will have the kind of dialogue that you, that you, you suggest uh, the different parameters and how these things could be used in the near future. All right, that what remains me is to thank Igor Sanovich for substantive and, and the, in the terminology of our session, productive uh, uh, and inputs and comments. So thank everyone for this participation and discussion and uh, hoping that uh, a year from now, we'll see other studies uh, concerning these problems on the one hand, moving forward. On the other hand, I'm hoping that the studies will become more comprehensive, more multi sided Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.